Well, good morning, church. Good to have uh, all of us here today, today and uh, especially at such a busy season with fair going on and uh, uh, back to school shopping on people's minds and all kinds of stuff that are happening at the end of the month of August, including people wrapping up vacations. So uh, we are thankful to be together, right? And uh, looking at God's word today, and we're going to... Uh, uh, read a wonderful psalm, Psalm 91, 16 verses. And uh, if you have your Bibles there, I'll, I'll read and uh, you follow along with us. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil will be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him, I will protect him. For he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long days of life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Incredible statements, right? Incredible for us to uh, realize the power and the care of God for his people. And that's really the theme of this psalm, the protection and deliverance of those who dwell in the Lord. Uh, this is not a, <clears throat> a reference to those who have gone on before us being with the Lord. It is a reference to us as God's people living in, being in, uh, God himself in his presence in a very spiritual way. So we're going to uh, look at this psalm, just a couple of interesting things that I think help us to understand the psalm. And uh, that is that Psalm 91 is, uh, is one of 17 psalms that are part of book four Remember, there are five books. The collection of the Psalms, 150 of them, are part of the Psalter. And yet within the Psalter, there are collections of songs. Some have similar themes. And uh, so they can be thought of together, though they're not necessarily physically together in the book itself. Among those in this particular book of Psalms, there are only uh, two of the psalms, or excuse me, three of the psalms that have the same author, two authors, actually. Moses, who writes Psalm 90, and David, who wrote Psalm 101 and 103. Many scholars have believed that for some time, uh, the Psalms 90, 91, and 93 uh, that are separate now were together. There were actually one psalm, and that one psalm, as we just saw, uh, being written by Moses. 
If, if it were true that they were one psalm and now divided over time, usage, uh, people looking at certain parts of this one psalm and, and uh, treating it as being different from the other two psalms that were part of it, they were divided, whether that's true or not. Uh, if, if it were true, just conjecture, Moses would have been the author of this particular psalm. And the interesting thing about that is that if that were true, this is a very old psalm. Uh, it is a psalm that uh, was around for a long time, and many of God's people knew this psalm uh, in the Old Testament and were familiar with it. The psalm breaks down into three different sections. And uh, in section one, uh, which include verses one and two, there are two speakers. The first speaker is the psalmist, who we can kind of think about in this psalm as being the teacher. And then in verse two, there is a second uh, speaker in this a particular instance, he's also a hearer because he has heard what the psalmist has said. And then in section three, uh, which include uh, verses, excuse me, section two, where the psalmist returns, uh, it, he is, um, it includes verse three through verse 13. And then finally in section three, verses 14 uh, through 16, and these are God's words himself. God uh, uh, is the one who is responding, and we'll see in just a minute how uh, all of that comes together. So let's go back to the text here, and we'll kind of walk our way verse by verse through this psalm. Verse 1 says that he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. This is the psalmist speaking. So whoever the psalmist is for this psalm, he is the one who is uh, writing this and he is actually speaking. Uh, remember, this is probably a, a song that was sung, whether it was a choral number or whether there were uh, a smaller ensemble of people and maybe three of them solos. We don't know uh, that, but you kind of have to conjecture, and that's why I, I think it's an interesting thing to, uh, to think that possibly Moses was the author of, of this song. There are some key words here that we need to focus on. Uh, the first is dwells. Uh, dwelling place is what we understand, right, to be our homes. Uh, typically, our dwelling place and our home are the same thing. But a dwelling place is a place where we um, have our own personal space. It's where we think about uh, going at the end of the day. It's where we keep our precious treasures it's where the people that we love typically are with us and we enjoy their presence. We, uh, we look forward to going home. If we're on vacation, we look forward to going home. It is the epicenter, right, of our world. Everything that happens, happens kind of around our dwelling place. And that's the idea here that is from a physical sense is being conveyed in a spiritual sense so that we can understand uh, what it is that he's talking about. Now, he who dwells in the second key word, shelter, which uh, is a place within this dwelling place. The, sh the word shelter, in fact, if you have a King James Bible, uh, today, your translation will probably say secret place. And it's a secret place because it's not the whole dwelling place. 
It is a place within that dwelling place that is set aside for us. In a sense, uh, what you find in uh, was happening throughout World War II in uh, those people who were making places within their homes as hiding places for Jews who were being sought uh, by the German army. Those hiding places would be an apt description of what this shelter is that the psalmist is talking about. And so it is with the, uh, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High God, and we'll see what that, uh, Most High and Almighty are the two names for God that are in this particular verse. And the shelter is a place that uh, is our, uh, our caring, where God cares for us as the Most High God. So the Most High God and the Almighty God are the same God, but they are different names for God, and they help us understand his character, uh, who it is that, that God really is, and how it is that we can relate to him and even understand or be glad uh, for who he is. But um, in, this, in this verse, we have dwells, shelter, most high. They're kind of two phrases. And in the second phrase, we have will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. So dwelling in the shelter of the most high God, most high being a reference to God's authority. There is no one higher than the most high. There is no authority, there is no throne, there is no place of governance that is higher than the place of the Most High God. And so that helps us to understand who this Most High God is, that those of us who dwell in the shelter of that uh, can be safe and secure. The second phrase says, that person will abide. And abide is a little different than dwelling. To abide in a place is to securely remain there. So you, you have the dwelling place, which is where you come and go from. Uh, but then within that, there is the shelter in which one abides securely and uh, is, is there uh, safely and, and in that place. That place is uh, set against, it's kind of juxt juxtaposed against the um, shadow. The shelter is juxtaposed against the shadow of the Almighty. And the Almighty is the name for God that is related to his power, his strength. He is the almighty, not just mighty. Because he is the almighty, there is nothing, no one, no thing uh, more powerful than our God, which gives us a sense then of being in the power, in the power of God, God being our defender, our deliverer in the shadow. So this is the shadow of the most high God. That's a big shadow, right? And there is no shadow bigger than the shadow that the most high God is going to cast. When we are in shadows, most of the time we're also in shade, right? So there's a security, there's a comfort. It's out from the burning heat, and, and that would not have been missed by the readers of this who are from the Middle East and, and going through very, very hot days when any kind of shade made by a shadow 
would be grateful place, where they would be grateful to be in that place. So in this first verse, we see that he who dwells, he who lives in the shelter of the Most High, will abide, will remain there securely in the shadow of the Almighty. Another thing that's interesting to me about shadows is, is that in the shade that they provide, there's kind, of a, there's kind of a relationship or a bond that takes place in your soul, at least it does for me, when I get into a shady place. If that shady place is a tree, for example, I really like that tree. I mean, that tree is set apart from all the other trees, right? Uh, unless there's a bigger tree and it's got more shade, and more shade would allow me to do more things, I might move. But I would and most likely be just real content to be there. I'd stay there a little bit longer uh, so that I wouldn't have to mow my lawn quite as quickly or finish mowing my lawn <laughs> quite as quickly because it was a nice, comfortable place to be. So I want us, I think this is an important thing. These, these concepts or these ideas are important to us as we go on to verse 2. Because in verse 2, we have the speaker being the one who has been listening to the psalmist. And his statement is a response to the statement that the psalmist makes. It's a simple statement, right? It's simply that he who dwells in the secret place or in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. It's not a sermon. It's not an invitation, although it's very inviting. But it's simply a statement. In verse 2, we have the hearer who has heard that statement and says, that's what I want. I want that. Because it offers, it provides so much, right? So, so he says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. I want you to notice some things here. First of all, I want you to notice that he says, I say, I say to the Lord. And the Lord is in caps, right? And it's, it's that, it's in caps for a reason. Whenever you see in your Bible, you're particularly new to Bible study, whenever you see L-O-R-D all in caps, it's a reference to the God of gods. It is a reference to Yahweh, the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is to the God who... Uh, is the, the Lord of all. So, so he says, I will say to the Lord, and the Lord is not in what the psalmist has said. He's making what the psalmist has said in terms of this God, his Lord. I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Twice in this short sentence, he uses I. And three times in this short sentence, he uses the word my. He is, he is very, this is a very personal thing with regard to his response. And it is a very, in, um, it, it's a very intentional phrase. So he's, he's very clear about his response to this. And he's, he says in the presence of the psalmist, imagine this being put to music. Um, he says to, to the psalmist, the Lord, I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. 
In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, we have a description, even a definition of faith. And it goes like this. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So the faith that is making God this person's, the hearer's God, the hearer's Lord of his life, are things that he has by faith said, I will trust in you. Faith and trust are not the same thing, but they are very closely related. Faith produces trust. Faith is like a muscle that you have to exercise. If you don't exercise it, it atrophies. That is, it doesn't really work very well anymore. So in order for your faith to be strong, you have to exercise it. And when you exercise it, you have the capability of trusting the things that you are believing for. You're trusting that they're right. You're trusting that who, whatever it is that God has an intent and purpose for you is going to be okay. You are with him in that, <clears throat> excuse me, in that agreement, in that understanding. So uh, in verse 2, we have this, the hearer confessing the Most High God and the, and the Almighty God as his Lord. And he trusts in him. His trust is the fruit of his faith. Hebrews 11, 6 says, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. The hearer of what he has heard the psalmist say is, is heard that this God is one that I can trust and I can place my faith in him uh, because without that faith, it's impossible to please him, but also with that faith, I can believe that not only God exists, but he rewards my faith. He satisfies what it is that I'm trusting him for. I can count on the fact that whatever he has said, he will do. And I can trust him uh, for that. And so I, I think that um, what is happening here for the hearer is that he's not only personalized what the psalmist has said generally, he has accepted that God is his shelter. God is, in fact, he even adds the word Ref, or a fortress here. He's, he's, he says in his response, not only is God my shelter, my, my refuge, God is my fortress. Not only is this a castle, this is a castle with a remote, with a moat, not a remote. Um, he, he, he is, it is a place where uh, there are uh, walls that have been erected. It's a walled city. It is safe and secure. There are guards there. God himself is caring for me, watching over me. And so it gives us, begins to give us a little more understanding about the next section, right? Which is section uh, uh, verses 3 through 13, where we come back to what the psalmist has said initially. So, so far we have the psalmist who's spoken, uh, the hearer who's spoken, and now we come back to the psalmist. And we're going to kind of um, walk quickly through this passage. But in verse 3 he says, he will deliver you, for he will deliver you. God will deliver you, you being the hearer, right? from the snare of the fowler. A snare, a fowler is one, 
And it's particularly true in, in if, this, if this is a very old psalm, but even if it's not an old psalm, uh, this, this fowler was one who, who caught birds uh, probably for his own satisfaction, his needs. Uh, he, and he would set a snare for them. Um, we'll see in a minute how that snare relates to uh, what it could be that the hearer is needing to be free of. But let's continue. Uh, so he, he says in verse 3, I will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the deadly pestilence. Pestilence is a plague. Um, interesting, interesting that uh, uh, there were plagues in those days. Interesting for us because we have antibiotics. But before antibiotics, folks, plagues were terrible things. And uh, they, they were things that people died from quickly. And uh, there, was, there was a lot of agony and, and hurt that came from that. Verse 4 says, he will cover you with his pinions. He will protect you from, that, from his pinions, his, his feathers. And under his wings, you will find refuge. Under his wings is a is a picture of a hen uh, gathering her chicks under her wings so that they're protected. In fact, um, we don't see a lot of that <clears throat> unless you're a farmer, you raise chickens. But um, uh, from my experience growing up on a farm, I, I remember hens having chicks underneath them and you really wouldn't know that they had chicks underneath them. They, they cover them so well. So they are also hidden. They're protected, and, and they are hidden. Um, under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness, his faithfulness is a shield and buckler. The Roman shield was a shield that was as high as the typical soldier. And he kept it in front of him, on a battle line, when two armies were coming face to face, they were marching toward each other, and they were moving their shield so they would be protected from the advance of the advancing soldier. The buckler is a small shield. It's probably that big around or so. They come in different sizes. Some of them are smaller. But they would be worn on the, on the soldier's arm. And if he were right-handed, he would have his weapon in his, or left, right-handed, his left hand would be the one where the buckler would be there. And it would protect him from close combat. So we see here in, in that image that God will cover us, protect us, but even in the face of danger. He's going to be faithful to us in caring for us. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. He's taking fear away from us. Uh, a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, and it will not come near you. I can't read this passage or this verse of Scripture without thinking of D-Day in Normandy and those soldiers who were uh, just simply dropped off and the beaches of Normandy to take the, the uh, difficult task of uh, shutting down the German forces that were in, entrenched in that area and men dying on this side and dying on that side and, and there you have I think a picture of a thousand may fall at your side 10,000 at your right hand but it will not come near you you will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked this is a spiritual picture, folks, that, that is being uh, drawn for us here in this 
uh, Saul. And the, the picture that's being drawn for us here in verse 8 is that the wicked and their wicked ideas that we become victims of in the world in which we live and some of you have been through those times. Maybe you're going through those times now. Uh, the recompense of the wicked is the judgment day when those who are wicked will experience the judgment of God. For those of us who are in the shelter of the Most High, we'll observe that. There will be a, I believe we will anyway, there will be a, a justification that's finally there. That though the wicked have gotten away with this and they've gotten away with that and I don't like it, but I pretty much have to deal with it because I'm in this place. I can't change it. God will change it one day. And when he does, we will feel the vindication and the, that the justification that God is in control and he will uh, let us see this with our eyes. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you, that's how God protects us. He protects us with angels who are his messengers. And he sends his messengers to us in times when we need his help, his deliverance, his protection. They may be silent and usually are. We don't see them what, and we don't see what they're doing. But we do, re, re, we benefit from what they do. We, we receive the results of that um, in, in their hands. Verse 12, uh, he, on, on their hands, on the angels' hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. In other words, they'll be there to catch you. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot because uh, so, so that's really at the end at the end of, of verse 13 here so there's some, some things that I think we, we need to look at and learn from these verses the blessings of verse 1 are only for those who believe and trust only those who have made God their dwelling place and their hiding place can experience the blessings of God's care and protection. I think that's so important for us. Um, and for us to know that there are many around us who live from, out from under those protections. They don't have God looking after them. If they cry out to God, it's more likely in blasphemy than it is out of calling on God's name to care for them, to love them, to demonstrate his love for them, to protect them. Uh, it, is, it is something that is a fact. It's, it's real. Psalm 1, verses 5 and 6, says that therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment. That is, they won't go through the judgment standing. That's what that means. Nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Sinners who are uh, among the righteous. And so you can't really look at someone and say they're a sinner or they're wicked. God knows that they are because they're intermingled with God's people. So, so that's what the psalmist is saying here, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Someday, just as the psalmist says here, uh, they will know his judgment. Now, at this point in the psalm, the psalmist kind of 
we would say today, drops the mic. And he doesn't, he doesn't have anything to, else to say. He's, he's said everything that he could say and drops the mic and walks off. What happens in this psalm, though, is that God picks up the mic and gives us verses 14 through 16. And uh, they, they read like this. God is God speaking because he holds fast to me. Who's the he? It's the hearer. The hearer is the he that God is referring to. And God is saying, the psalmist said this about me. I'm saying this about myself. I'm telling you now, this is God speaking, that because he holds fast to me, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Him being the one who has expressed his faith, his trust, his confidence, <clears throat> excuse me, in both the Most High and the Almighty God. That to me is, is thrilling, isn't it? It's, it's thrilling. The psalmist, uh, the psalmist has said it. Now God is speaking in this psalm and he's saying it to us and for us firsthand. He's saying it to us directly through the psalm. That if we dwell in the shelter of the Almighty, or excuse me, Most High, we will... Uh, find his refuge and his blessings in uh, the presence of God, his presence. Psalm 91 invites everyone. It's, it's a statement that we can all have confidence in. Everyone to dwell in the shelter of the Most High. Maybe it's more like anyone. Anyone who sees that statement and says, that's for me. I want that care. I want that protection. I want to know and live in the presence of that God. That's for me. There is a mutually understood reason why God's shelter is important, especially in it seems this way anyway, especially in the days in which we live today. There's a sense that trouble's around the corner, isn't there? There's this, there's this uh, apprehension. There's this uh, intensified uh, wonderment of, of what's coming down the pike, what's coming next. Um, the writer of this psalm clearly believed that there was that kind of situation in the day in which he was living. Maybe if it was Moses, it would have been one of the times when there was a lot of trouble in Israel as they were wandering in the desert. We only can say that by conjecture. And he also knew the Most High God well enough to trust him, so he chose to trust him. They knew that they needed shelter, they needed care, they needed protection. Even though this psalm was written several thousand years ago, the invitation of this statement is just as welcome today as it would have been then. Um, if you're here today uh, and you are feeling the need for God's protection, you can't recall a time in your life when you have said to God himself that what the psalmist says here uh, is for you in, in verse 2 
Um, you've never said that before, but you'd like to say that. And today can be a day when you do that. Uh, there will be people here that you can speak to. Uh, some of us will, will be down front uh, if you want to come forward. But you, if, if that's not you and you want to take the con Connect card that's in the seat in front of you there and you want to fill out a note for us, put it in one of the boxes as you leave. Someone will respond to you and be happy to talk with you about whatever it is that you're experiencing and, and feeling that may relate to the psalm that we heard today. I close with this verse from 2 Peter. The Lord is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful psalm. We thank you that you are the most high God, that there is no one higher than you, no greater authority, that there is no power in this earth by some of the most powerful countries and, and uh, militaries that we see and, and are aware of. Lord, your power is greater and so, Lord, it is to you that we appeal today. Uh, we make you and desire to make you our Lord. We thank you for being our Lord, for those of us who have made you our Lord. And we are grateful, Lord, for your care and your protection, your promised deliverance. And we know that even in the face of trouble, even in the face of calamity that we may experience, that trouble and calamity is not outside your awareness and it's not outside of your purpose and your will for our lives. And so we, we surrender to it, Lord. We trust you that you are our great God. We say this in Jesus' name, amen.